Hello, everyone. Everybody having a good day? I'm not. I've got a weird mic, and I'm supposed to be live coding for the entire session. I'm going to live code with my left hand. And yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, anyhow, um, the session of the day is, is authentication in ASP.NET Core. So if anybody's in here not wanting to hear about authentication in ASP.NET Core, there are other rooms with much better sessions. Um, so, my name is Chris Klug, um, I work, uh, actually my official title okay. is Ninja, that's kind of cool. All of our developers at our company are called Ninjas. Uh, I work for a company called 1337 in Stockholm. Oh! Thank you. Let's try it now. Do I get audio? Hello. Okay, that seems to work. Um, okay, so I work for a company called Tetum which is 1337 in Swedish, um, where we do custom software development um, on the Microsoft platform. I've been doing it for about 20 years now, um, and I also do, um, I'm a Microsoft MVP, I am think I'm supposed to say. And also, one thing that's interesting for this session is that I do plural type videos. So all of the stuff that I'm showing today, damn microphone. Um, all the stuff that I'm showing today is actually from one of my courses. So if you want to have more information about what I'm showing you today, there is a course on Pluralsight that will walk you through what I'm showing today and a bunch more and over the time of like four hours. So I did a bit more than 50 minutes. Um, having that said, I have no more slides. And I have a ton. We're talking a crap ton of stuff to show you. So I'm hoping that I'll get through all of it. If not, Tough. Um, you're more than welcome to stop me along the way and say, Chris, I have no idea what you're saying. I won't have time to explain what I'm saying, but you're more than welcome to stop me. Um, other than that, let's just, let's just jump in, right? So in ASP.NET Core 2, they rewrote the entire authentication. Yes, you are going to get to see more. I am, you don't need to see that little thing over there. You need to see the code, so you'll see more. In ASP.NET Core, they rewrote the entire authentication stack. Actually, they rewrote it for ASP.NET Core reusing a bunch of stuff that they had in, in uh, Project Katana and Owen before. And then in ASP.NET Core 2, they actually rewrote the whole thing. So what I've done is I've built this little web application. You're going to see exactly what a fantastic web developer I am. Look at that. That, my friend, is ASP.NET Core 2 running on my laptop with a bootstrap theme, and it looks like shit. I don't really care about what it looks like. It's all about the functionality. So it's, uh, it's, it's semi-readable. So it's a simple web application. It has a registration button, a login button. It has a, uh, a home button up here, a login button, and a register button. That's all I want to talk about today is authentication, registration, and login. So with this thing, I'm just going to jump back into my code. And this is the project up here. So I'm going to open up the startup file. Can everyone see that? Ish at least. I'm sorry about the people in the back. The screen is really, really low. I'll try to scroll up so you can see uh, what I'm doing. So I'm up here in Configure Services. So this is the entry point to the application. And what we want to do is want to add, add authentication, right? So we'll go in here to the Services, which is our IOC container. We'll just do Services dot add authentication. Cool. We've got authentication. Authentication, however, is a slightly more complicated than just doing that because you actually have to tell it what kind of authentication we want to do. So I want to do local logins. So I want to do cookie-based authentication. So I'm just going to, after this, I'm just going to continue. So it's all fluent uh, syntax. So I'm just going to go ahead and add cookie. So I've got cookie authentication in there. I'm just going to be OK with having cookie. That's all I need for now. And I'm going to say cookie config. I'm going to give it those two parameters. So what we get is we get a callback method that we can pass in to add cookie or add Facebook or whatever authentication mechanism we want. And we just tell it, here is what I need to configure. So for cookies, I just want to tell it that the login path is slash auth slash login. So if anybody ever needs to log in, send him over in that direction. If you get access denied, this is nice. In previous versions, there was no difference between unauthenticated or unauthorized. So basically, whether or not you had been authorized was, didn't matter. So if you came to a web page and you weren't allowed in there, you would be sent to the login page with no way of figuring out whether or not, well, actually, there was a way. But 
very little way of notion of saying that you are logged in, but you're not allowed to access this page, versus you are not allowed to lo you're not lo logged in, so you're not allowed to access this page. Those are actually two kind of different things, right? One, I want to send you to go and log in, and the other one is I want to tell you to fuck off because you don't have access. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say that. I need to tell you to uh, not go to that page because you don't have access. I'm from Sweden. We swear a lot. Sorry about that. And it's recorded. <laughs> so, I've got this thing in here, access denied, login path. That should be pretty good. Um, I do need to tell ASP.NET Core, however, what uh, authentication mechanism I want to use. So up here in Add Authentication, I'm going to say Cookie Authentication Default dot Authentication Scheme. That basically tells ASP.NET Core that in any situation when anybody needs to do anything with authentication, use Cookie Authentication. It's a string. So the method that the, the value I passed in is just a string that didn't help you very much. On my screen, it says that it's a string. And we can have as many, many different authentication mechanisms as we want. But I've only got a cookie authentication, so I'll default to that. OK. Um, that configures all of the services. So now I have authentication plugged into my application. I also need to plug it into the request pipeline so that when the user comes in, he's actually, he or she is actually authenticated. So down here in the configure method, I'm going to go ahead and say app.useAuthentication. That adds a middleware into the request pipeline that will make sure that the user gets authenticated on the way in. So in this request pipeline where the user comes in from the top and goes through this and then that and then that, after this thing here, the user will be authenticated. It will also make sure that if you send a, an unauthenticated or unauthorized uh, status code back, it will automatically redirect the user to, uh, to the login page. OK, so I've got authentication plugged in. That's actually all we need to do. Next step, sign in or register users. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to controllers and auth controllers. It's, th there's a bit in here, but we'll start out with register, because that's the first thing we want to do. We're going to register a user. First thing, we show the user a view. So we just show the user a registration view where we can fill in username and password and all of that. User posts that back to this endpoint here with a name and an email and a password. password. And then I register that in my database. It's not actually a database. Um, you'll get all this code, so you can, can download it. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's actually not persisted in any form of database. It's persisted in a JSON file on disk, which is really, really bad practice. It's a demo. Don't ever let me near your production code. That's a recipe for disaster. So once I've got the user authenticated or registered in my system, I need to actually sign the user in in my web page. So this is where authentication comes into play. So I'm going to go and say sign in user one. The first thing I want to do is I want to figure out what claims the user has. So in ASP.NET Core, um, actually even in ASP.NET MVC 4.5, um, everything is claims based. So we say I claim that this user is whatever. So I give the user a claim of name identifier that contains the user's email address. I save a, an, a claim called name with the username, an email with the user's email. So those are the claims that, that this user can claim to have. Once I've got my claims list, I can then do sign in user 2. I can take my claims and create a claims identity. I create an identity, and I pass in the claims that I want this user to have, basically all the properties of this user. Important thing, second parameter to claims identity is cookie authentication default authentication scheme basically telling it this is the, the thing that's signing him in in the end. If we set this up wrong, the user doesn't actually, the user gets kind of authenticated, but it kind of blows up and doesn't work. So you need to use the correct thing here, saying that I'm signing in the user with cookie authentication. Once I've got my identity, I can create a, create a principle. And finally, once I have my principle, that is basically the entity that represents my user in the application, all I need to do is This HTTP context dot sign in async, which is a um, an extension method, and I pass in my principle. 
this will set a variable um, on a specific object in the Owen request pipeline. And then on the way out, when I send a response back to the user, the, the authentication middleware will pick up that and say, oh, you tried to sign this user in. I'm going to go ahead and sign him in using, you told me to use cookie authentication, so I'm going to go and tell this thing to whoever cares. Honestly, in the end, you get a cookie. That's all you need. So in the end, calling HTTP context that sign in a thing, passing in a principle, will cause the application to sign in the user with whatever authentication mechanism you either tell it to use or is the default one. And the default one in this case, as I set up before, is cookie authentication uh, that I've passed in here. So by default, it's going to sign in using cookie authentication. If I run this application, this actually, and then I redirect the user to the, to the user information page, showing the user the information about the user. If I run this, I need to learn to tap dance or something like that, because it always takes time to build stuff. Here we are, we've got my application. I press register. I need to register, so I'm going to sign in myself or register myself. That posts the information back, principle is created, and cookie is being set up for me. And if uh, it's really hard for you to see in the back, I assume. But basically, we get our claims here saying that I've got a claim called name identifier, which is Chris at 59 North. I've got a name, which is Chris. And I've got an email address, which is Chris at 59 North. And all of this is then stored by default in a cookie on the machine. Did that seem complicated? If we ignore the fact that there is a ton of stuff under the hood that sorts all of this out for you, all you need to do to get authentication is register authentication services in your services container, register the type of authentication you want to use, in this case, cookie authentication, create a claims principle, sign in the claims principle, and the system takes care of the rest for you. Fairly simple. However, if I try to log out my user right now, that is not what we want to see, right? So what, how, how complicated is signing out? Well, it is less than complicated. All you do is sign out, you write this. That's not what you write. You write that. H, await is an async, async operation. All of these things are always asynchronous because you might need to do asynchronous work when signing somebody out. So we do HTTP context but sign out async. That will then take care of getting rid of the, the cookie and all that stuff. You don't have to care. The system sorts that out. And then you go redirect to action index home, save this, press log out. And I'm logged out. Woo! Nobody's impressed. Tough crowd. Um, next one, logging in. Logging in can't might be much harder, but right now I get to this point. But when I press log in here, this thing goes not implemented. Okay, so we need to implement logout. Oh, sorry, login. And logging in is actually very, very, very similar to this here. We create a claims list. We create an identity, we create a principle, and we sign in the user. So that is actually exactly the same for my registration flow as it is for my logging in flow. So I'm going to go and say extract method, name it sign in user. So instead of having it here in line, I just extract it into a separate method. Being the weird person I am, I want to have it at the end because it's private. So I've just extracted out my sign-in user code here to the end. And once I've got that, we can go up to the login action, which is here. In here, there's just general logic around, is the model state valid? Uh, have, is the user email and password correct? And all of that. So all the nitty gritty of actually validating the user is already done in my user service. But then here at the end, once I've got my user authenticated, I can just go and say, await sign in user. 
pass in my user and then go sorry, return awaits. Because my sign in user down here actually returns nope. Chris, you should learn how to do this. Let's start over. I want to have one more line of code, which is stupid I didn't get to begin with. I want to have all of that. So I want to have the redirect in there as well, because I want to do redirects, the same redirect all the time. So let's try that again. Extract method, sign in user. So once again, you call, take all of your code for signing in. You extract that out into a separate method at the end here. And then up here in the login, we just say return await sign in user. And as I said, it's exactly the same code as we did for registration. Create a claims identity, create a claims principle, sign in the user, redirect the user. And it just works. Okay, does that look complicated? No, nope. thank you. If that looks complicated, um, you have way more complicated things in your life, I promise you, and it's gonna suck. So the problem with this is that how many of you are actually doing local logins today? How many of you are actually doing social logins or external login systems, like logging users in with Facebook or Twitter? one hand going up with Facebook, Twitter, no one with local login. So basically, you're not authenticating users. What do you do for a living? <laughs> Only like public commercial websites about showing off some product, because that's every single application I've ever done needed somebody to sign in, basically. So the whole cool, all, all the cool kids now are, are using social authentication, right? Nobody wants to sign in using local logins. I personally hate having to sign up for, a, for an application. If I can use my Facebook authentication, I'd much rather do that. Number one, I trust Facebook more than I trust most other developers. Yes, they're going to steal all of my information and sell it, but I know that. But at least they're going to keep my information safe. So for Facebook, it's actually kind of cool. I go back out to my startup class, and down here, underneath my ad cookie, I'm going to go and say, I'm just going to go and say, add Facebook, add Twitter. And in the callback for Facebook, I pass in the app ID for my Facebook application and my app secret from Facebook. By the way, never, ever, ever show people your secrets. <laughs> Least of all, don't record it. <laughs> I'm going to kill this app afterwards, I promise. For now, you're more than welcome to go and abuse my Facebook application. Um, and for Twitter, I do the same thing. I just set the consumer key and the consumer secret. They're named differently, but they're pretty much the same thing. So I already have two applications at Facebook and Twitter. But next, once I've got those registered, I need to give the users a way to actually say I want to log in using Facebook. So I'm going to go to my view here. I'm going to go to the auth and the login view. And down here at the bottom, I'm going to say extern... Down here at the bottom, I'm going to go and say, I'm going to inject a little service that Microsoft provides from, from the authentication, which is called iAuthentication Scheme Provider, which provides authentication schemes. Duh. Um, using that, I can say, can I please get all the schemes that the user can log in with that is a request handler? So basically, give me all the stuff that I just registered. And for each one of those services, I want to create an a, a little link here that goes to an action called login external, and it passes in the name of the scheme uh, as an ID. Make sense? So that's going to give me a couple of big buttons. Then I need to go and create a login external method on my auth controller. So let's go back to the auth controller here, and somewhere around here. I'm creating a new route called login external slash ID. And in it, I only, all I do is I, I return HTTP context dot challenge async. Sending back a challenge is basically telling the system, can you please make sure that this user gets authenticated? 
and I give it the ID, which is the name of the scheme that I want the user to sign in with, so it's going to be Facebook or Twitter. I don't have to care. I don't, I don't care what, how to sign into Facebook or Twitter. It doesn't matter. System, solve it for me. User wants to log in with Facebook. I don't care. But I also need to provide a redirect URI that says, after the user has logged in, can you please make sure that he's redirected to slash user info? If you forget that, you get redirected back to the page you're on at the moment, which is the login page, like the, or sorry, the, uh, the login external. So I'm going to come back to this URL again if I don't provide that, which is then going to create another challenge and send me to Facebook that sends me back to the site, which is this thing here that sends me to Facebook. And it's generally going to be a sucky afternoon. So make sure that you provide one of those. I didn't when I built the code, because I'm stupid. Um, once I've got that in place, I can now log out. Press login. And all I have to do is press Facebook here. And the authentication system takes care of building up this weird, you're not even going to see it, but there's like the world's longest URL up there with a gazillion parameters. And all I get here is, not that you're seeing it, but it says auth demo, which is my application, will receive public profile and email address. Do I agree to that? Yes, because auth demo is a fantastic application and I know the builder, guy who built it. And I come back here. I didn't have to take care of sending the user to Facebook or making sure that I had the callback path and handle everything that came back from Facebook or anything like that. Facebook just, or the authentication system solved it for me, and I got a name identifier, an email address, a name, a given name, and a surname from Facebook. But authentication is the only part that um, Facebook organizes. So once the user comes back to my application, the user is actually signed in using cookies. So without me touching anything, with me just saying add cookie, add Facebook, the system figures out that once the user has been to Facebook and got authenticated and I know who the user is, I'm going to take that JSON token and I'm going to send that over to the cookie authentication middleware that signs in the user with a cookie and gives me a cookie so I'm signed into the application. Really cool stuff. And Twitter is exactly the same, so I'm not going to show you. Uh, I'm just going to get sent to Twitter instead. But there is a small problem with this. When I sign in with a local account now using cookie authentication, I get a name identifier, a name, and an email. If I sign in with Facebook, I get a name identifier, a name, an email, a given name, and a surname. And if I sign in with Twitter, I get a name identifier and a name. I don't get an email address. So very often we want to go ahead, when somebody signs up using an external provider, we want to make sure that we take that external provider's identifier, but then are able to add profile information for the user, right? And the way that we do that in ASP.NET Core is actually quite simple and quite smart. I can add as many authentication options as I want here. So I can go in here at the end and say, I want to have another cookie provider. But this cookie authentication middleware is going to be called temp cookie. So this has now has a completely separate authentication provider called temp cookie, has a completely separate cookie. And once I've got that, I can then go up to my Twitter uh, authentication and say options.sign in scheme temp cookie, telling uh, the Twitter authentication and Facebook authentication middleware that once the user has been authenticated, sign in the user with the temp cookie one, not the proper one, which signs the user into the system, Sign him in with this other thing over here that will also create a cookie, but it's not the proper cookie to be signed into the system. Okay, what else do we need? Well, we need to go into the auth controller, and we need to change the redirect here, the this redirect after authentication, to slash auth slash register external is what I want. So once the user has been authenticated and signed in with the temp cookie, he comes back to a register external uh, action. And let's go ahead and add that thing here. So I create this action here. And what I do here at the top 
is I call await HTTP context dot authenticate async. Because by default, the authentication system will look at the proper cookie, not the temp one. So I need to go and tell the system, can you please uh, authenticate this user using the temp cookie middleware instead, or temp cookie authentication? That gives me an authentication result that basically shows me if the user is signed in as a, with the temp cookie. And if the person is not signed, out, signed in with the temp cookie, something has been wrong, gone wrong, they've ended up here in the wrong way, I send them back to the home page. If the user is signed in with the temp cookie, I go and add them to my database, or rather, sorry, I go and authenticate them in my database and say, is there somebody in this database with this name identifier, basically this Facebook ID or this Twitter ID? If there is a user in the system with that ID already, I go ahead and call sign in external, method I will create in a minute. If not, it's a new user. So I need them, the user to provide the profile information for the application. So I show them a view where they can provide their name and their email. And I pre-populate the name and the email with the claim values that I got from the endpoint. So if Facebook, for example, this will be pre-populated with name and email. But for Twitter, there will only be a name. There won't be an email, for example. And then I show that, that view to the user. The sign in external method. Very simple thing, it's actually, all it does is it signs out the user with it from the temp cookie, basically saying, can you please sign out this user from the temp cookie authentication middleware? So this will remove the temporary cookie, and then afterwards it signs in the user with the proper cookie again, and basically goes, I, the user is now properly signed in, everything is fine. And finally, once the user has actually provided the information that we want, we'll do sign in ex uh, no. register external post. I have another method here. This is where we post the information, basically when we post back the, the name and the email. Once again, I make sure that the user is actually signed in with the temporary uh, authentication system, so that the user is temporarily signed in. Then I check my model state to see if the user has provided all the information that's needed. Then I add it to my database. And what I add here is I add the user or the, the profile information using the name identifier because every single authentication provider will give us a name identifier, some form of unique key. Remember, though, that that name identifier is unique for that provider. So you can't just assume that a Facebook name identifier is going to be unique from a Twitter identifier. They are, but you can't assume it for most of these things. So you want to prefix it or something like that. And then I store the name and the email uh, with that name identifier. And then I sign in the user again. So with that flow, oh, we want to have one more thing. In the register part here in my view, I obviously want to have the um, I want to show the external provider so that when we sign in, we get a choice of what external provider to use. So with that in place, I can go out here and click register. That should show me a registration page. At the bottom, we see Facebook and Twitter. So I'm going to click Twitter. We go up to Twitter. Twitter asks me, do you trust Zero Call's auth demo? Of course, because Zero Call is a really cool guy. I authorize that, I come back here, it says, please register the rest of the information. I can now go and try to get into the rest of the application in whatever form I want. I'm still just going to be temporarily signed in. So I won't get access to anything as a sign in user. If I sign in here and I add my email address and I register, I get signed in and I get the, the profile information that we expect, not random stuff depending on what provider we're using. Does that make sense? Is it understandable? It is pretty high pace, I know, and I'm pretty hopped up and happy right now and, and glad to be here. So it's, it's going very fast, but we've got limited amount of time to show stuff. So I'm going to kill this now. Um, we're going to stop doing uh, local stuff. So instead, we're going to go ahead and we're going to pull out another demo I have. Has anybody worked with Azure? It's the same guy, the guy with the authentication stuff. <laughs> I like him. I like you guys. Um, 
So Azure offers a, a way to sign in called Azure ADB2C, which is an Azure Active Directory business to consumer thing, where we can go in and register an Active Directory. Microsoft takes care of hosting that directory, signing users in and everything, but it's, it's weirdly so that you can actually plug in other providers. So you can say, I want to use Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or Google, or I want to be able to sign up using an email address. They make sure that email is verified and all of that. So they take all of that load of registering and, and logging in users. All you need to do is basically say, go there and register. Go there and sign in. So what we want to do is, I'm, this is just a plain old application again. It's pretty much identical to the previous one. And by pretty much, I mean completely identical to the previous one. So I'm going back to configure services. We do services dot add authentication. And Azure ADB to c uses something called OpenID Connect, which is a new version or a better version for authentication than OAuth uh, that we used to have. So I'm going to go add open, open ID Connect, like that. And what I want to do, is I need to give this a name. So uh, Azure ADB to c uses something called Profiles which is a bastardization of the OpenID Connect protocol. So basically, we had this really good protocol, and then Microsoft went and said, we're taking that, but we're modifying it. So they make a separate URL. It's actually kind of cool. They have something called policies, where each policy is a, is a functionality you can do at that endpoint. So you have a policy for signing in. You have a policy for signing up, you have a, which is registering. You have a policy for signing in or up. You have a policy for editing your profile information and stuff like that. So they basically offer a bunch of extra services divided into what they call policies. So I've signed up a, a couple of different policies that I want to use. I've signed up one called B2C underscore one, which are underscore, which is the name that all policies get for some reason by default. And then it's called sign in. So it's a sign in policy. So I name, I name my uh, authentication uh, scheme the same thing. You'll see later on why I name it, but naming it to the same thing as the policy gives us a feature later on in the demo that I'll come back to. And what we need to do in here is we need to configure this options thing with a ton of things. And they're all pretty much the same for all the, the different uh, policies. So I'm going to create a little ADB2, that was a stupid name to give this thing, options config, there it is. So I'm giving it this method here. It takes an OpenID Connect options object, which is what I get up here. And then it configures it with all of the stuff that I need for it to be OK with, with uh, Azure AD B2C, which is a metadata address that is unique to my tenant, which is a long thing that you find in the Azure portal, with the name of the policy at the end. And then we give it the client ID, which is a unique identifier for my, my tenant, and then a bunch of other things. All of this is pretty much defined on the web. You can find it on the Azure portal. The only thing that I do is I also change the callback path and signed out callback path, because I'm going to add many different OpenID Connect authentication um, services. They need to have their own callback path, basically an own, their own endpoint that the user comes back to after authenticating. So once the user has been to the Azure ADB to c they're going to be sent back to slash sign in dash OIDC dash and then the name of the policy. So each one of these policies get their own callback path. Otherwise, they're going to collide and say, you suck. Actually, it doesn't say that. It says something about correlation IDs, but it's basically, you suck. Once I've got this helper method here, I can go ahead and I can call that up here in my callback and say, can you please configure this options thing here and the policy that I'm using is b2c underscore one underscore sign underscore in. And then I do the same thing for all of the other policies that I want to use. Let's do, that's not what I wanted. Okay, x. Let's go ahead and add um, a d b 2 c Damn, I hate this naming. Config, that's the one that I want. So I do the same thing for my sign in or up policy and for my sign up policy, so basically my registration thing. So I configure three different uh, OpenID Connect uh, you know, authentication um, handlers. And then at the end here, that's just authentication. Once again, Microsoft will authenticate the user. He will not sign in the user into our application. So we need to add cookies at the end. So 
So I'm going to go ahead and say dot add cookie at the end to add the cookie middleware, because we're going to do cookie authentication in the end. And then I need to tell it that before I, I'm not going to talk while I type this. A D B two C auth default. That's one. So what we can do here is, previously I just said, please use cookie authentication default. So basically use cookie authentication for everything. But in this case, I actually want to do something else. I want to say, by default, I want you to sign in using cookie authentication. I want you to sign out using cookie authentication. But when somebody challenges the user and says you have to log in, can you please use the B2C one under, underscore one underscore sign underscore in underscore or underscore up thing? And if you want to do, once you authenticate, when the user comes in on every request, can you please use the cookie authentication to authenticate the user? So we can say different things, like if the user is, needs to be authenticated, use this thing. If you need to sign in, use this thing. So we can use all these different things. And what I need to do is use cookie authentication for everything but the default challenge. OK, so I've got my OpenID Connect stuff configured. Next step is the one that I always forget, and it takes me 10 minutes to figure out why it doesn't work every time. You need to add this. If you don't add the authentication middleware, it kind of works halfway. You can, you can challenge the user, and the user gets sent off to ADB to C, and then when it comes back, it goes, poof, you suck. Don't forget that. It needs to be there. What else do we need to do? We need to log in the user. Or, and register the user. So I'm going to the auth controller. And this is kind of cool, because I, I don't care. I don't have to show any UI or anything. That's all handled by Microsoft. So for logging in, I'm going to go ahead and say adb2c challenge. adb2c. What happened to adb2c challenge? Oh, this is going to suck. This is going to suck bad. I had a snippet for that. Oh, there it is. It's called login challenge, not challenge. There it is. So what I want to do here is I, I call out a challenge, basically say, can you please sign in this user? I don't tell it, well, I, I tell it what, where to sign, go after signing in. And then I need to tell it what policy to use. So I want to use B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore in. And then we'll do. For registration, we'll just do same thing, but can you please go to the sign up? And for signing out, we'll just do um, await HTTP context dot sign out async, and then we'll do ad sign there it is, and then I'm actually going to call sign out twice. So the first one is going to sign out the user from the local cookie. But then I'm going to go out and I'm going to pull out the authentication scheme view. So basically, the name of the policy that I'm going to use for the sign-in is actually stored in a claim that I get back from the authentication provider. So by using that policy as the same name as my authentication uh, handler, I can go and pull out that claim, which is then going to say, in this case, maybe B2C sign up, because I've just signed up. And then I'm going to call HTTP context or sign out async with that name of that scheme. And then it's going to find out that I need to sign out from Azure AD because I have a, a handler for that. And then that handler is going to send me off to Azure AD to sign me out. And then I'm going to come back to the home page. So if I demo this, let's see if this works. We don't have to do very much. So as I said, we don't have to have any UIs. We all, all we have to do is go to Azure portal, point and click, and it's all good. So I've got to the register here because I don't have a user. Oh, that is kind of cool. I've also signed up. So not only can I sign up using email, I can also sign up using Facebook and Twitter. And if I sign up using Facebook and Twitter, I can also define what properties do I need. Do I need a name, a given name, a surname, and all of that? And Microsoft will make sure to do all of that stuff that I just did, which is authenticate the user and then collect all that in user information for me. So let's go with Facebook. I get, go off to Facebook. I've already authenticated my application because I did that in the previous demo. It asks me for an email address and the display name, and I go continue. And if you register using an email address, it actually 
sends you an email with a verification code to verify your email and all of that. So it does verify the email, and you can do that with Facebook as well. But we come in here, and we get a ton of claims. We get a uh, name identifier, a name, uh, an identity provider. Um, we get a unique ID, an object identifier for the object in the Azure AD. Uh, we get a claim saying that it's a new user. So new user equals true, so we can give the user a specific greeting if they're a new user. We get the email, and we get the TFP here, which is the name of the um, this policy that was used when this user was signed in. And if I press log out now, it's going to look up the TFP one and sign up the user. And if I go to log in now, I should be OK logging into Azure AD using Facebook by just clicking there. What you didn't see in the logout phase is that it actually goes to Azure AD and signs out the user from that instance as well. So I get redirected and come back. It's just very, very fast. Let's see if you can actually see it. Nope, but it's there. Trust me. Always trust the guy that says, trust me. OK, is everybody with me so far? Ish? As I said, there's a whole course on this, and it's going to be high paced when we've only got 50 minutes. Uh, sorry, I've only got eight minutes to demo the last stuff. So the last thing is, what if we don't want to use an external provider that we don't own? What if we want to have an identity provider that we own, but external to our application so we can use it from several different applications? There's a cool project called Identity Server, uh, which does that. It's just an identity server. It identi or authenticates users. And it's open source. It's built by a couple of guys from the community. It supports OpenID Connect. Uh, it comes with a UI if you want to. And if you start it up, you get this thing here. It's completely uh, skinnable, so you can change all of the UI for it. But it's basically just built to authenticate users. So in this thing, I have registered an application, and I've registered a user that can sign in and all of that. That's kind of not part of the demo. All I want to show you is that once you've got an identity server, the web end of it is actually ridiculously close to what I just showed you. So if we go in here, go to the startup file. Once again, we do services.addAuthentication to add authentication, right? Dot add open ID connect, because we want to do open ID connect. Um, and in here, we do IDS config. And we need to give it a bunch of things, right? We need to give it, where is my identity server? Well, it's at localhost port 5000. whoop de doo it's local. Uh, I'm cheating. I'm using HTTP. I'm not HTTPS. I didn't feel like installing a client certificate that doesn't work in Chrome very well. So I just say, require HTTPS metadata equals false. Don't freaking do that in production ever, or I will come back and molest you and kill you, OK? I add whatever naughty stuff I can, just get people to understand that you don't want to do that. It's, it's crap, right? Always HTTPS. Even in dev, to be perfectly honest, you might as well. It's just it adds a couple of layers to my demo. That's kind of annoying. Client ID, configured in identity server. Uh, redirect after signing, go to slash. Save tokens, very important. That saves the original token in my cookie so that when I sign out, I pass that token uh, to the identity server so that identity can figure out to automatically redirect me after signing out. Kind of annoying thing to have to do, but I've talked to the guys and apparently part of the spec. And then at the end here, I just have this little thing that listens to events and says, if something goes wrong during authentication, redirect the user to slash. Probably you want to do something else. But in this case, if you press cancel during the authentication phase, it actually is considered a fault. So you come back here, and this thing explodes unless you listen to it. Once I got that, once again, open ID is just authentication. So we'll do add cookie at the end, because we do want to do cookie authentication for everything. And add uh, app use authentication to add authentication to my request pipeline. And to sign in the user, we'll just go to controllers, auth controller, signing in a user, piece of cake, IDS challenge. Please sign in this user, you rock. Actually, I missed one thing here. I need to tell it what authentication schemes to use. So I use cookie for everything but challenge. So for challenge, I'm just going to say, whenever somebody needs to sign in, do it using OpenID Connect. So in here, all I have to do is tell it, go here when you're done. Signing out, 
Signing out is pretty much the same thing that we did before. Sign out the local cookie. And then sign out using OpenID Connect authentication as well. That will then, as I said, sign out local kills the cookie, sign out authentication, OpenID Connect will redirect the user to op uh, identity server and then back again to sign out the user properly. This should be good to go. I've got four minutes to demo single page application authentication. This is going to be awesome. So I go to login. I get redirected over here. This is identity server. So I log in using my account. And I come back here, and identity server gives me all this information. And you in identity server can define exactly what is provided, when the user signs in, profile information, and all of that. All you need to do as an application is say, over there is an identity server that supports OpenID Connect. Go and do your thing over there and come back once you've been authenticated. So I have a spa as well. No, it's not a spa. Uh, it's a, a crappy JavaScript application, but apparently that is called a spa in our business. In here, I can call an API. It comes back and you can't see it, but it says curly brace ID colon one. So basically, I called an API and I got an ID back. This thing is using JavaScript. And by default, JavaScript calling an API will pass a cookie to the, to the server, right? The browser will pass a cookie to whatever, endpoint, whatever domain name the cookie is assigned to. Don't use cookies for single page applications. Don't use cookie authentication for APIs that you call from JavaScript because you're, you're open for cross-site request for your cross-site scripting. So what you want to do is you want to stay away from using cookies on JavaScript. So what you want to use instead is actually something called bearer tokens. And it's actually, it's, it's ridiculously simple to set up bearer tokens as well. We go down here, after our cookie here, we'll just say, oh, not that button, not that button either, those buttons. And I want to have IDSJWT auth. So I add another authentication provider called JWT Bearer, so JSON Web Token Bearer Authentication. That requires us to pass a JSON Web Token in a header with all of the calls, which is much safer, so the JavaScript has to add that th the header to every call to be authenticated. I tell it who is going to issue the token for us, because it's going to be signed. And then I say only people that are allowed to access the scope API 1 is allowed to access this thing. So I can also segment off parts of my application based on the token. Once I got that, I need to go into my API. And in here, in the authorized attribute that we're used to seeing, we can actually add something called authentication schemes to tell it what schemes am I allowed to authenticate when it comes to this. JWT the def bearer default dot authentication scheme. I want the user to be authorized to be able to access this, this controller, but he is only allowed to be authorized using JSON web token bearer tokens. So if I go back out here now, refresh this, I've got one more minute. I might go one minute over. Um, refresh this, I call this, I'm now going to get an 401 unauthorized. That's good ish. So what we need to do, I'm using a little, little client library called uh, oidcclient.js. It's a JavaScript client from the same guys who built identity server. So what we need to do is we actually need to sign in. So we need to sign in using the JavaScript. So I'm adding a sign in and sign out button. And all I need to do in here is make sure that my sign in and sign out button use the oidc user manager, which comes out of that oidc client project, and say, on click of sign in, go and sign in. On sign out, go and sign out. And then I add, I get a user back, and then I add a header, an authorization header here with the user's access token. If I go out here now and press F5, what did I just screw up? They're all dis disabled, but they're kind of supposed to be disabled. I broke something. Oh, there it is. It works. Um, obviously, it works. <laughs> Call API, use SOC 401 unauthorized. Sign in. 
pops up a window, but already figures out in that window that you're already authorized at the identity server, so it closes the window. I'm signed in. I call the API. My JavaScript adds that authorization header with the access token, and I can call the API. If I log out now, I get logged out from the cookie, right? But if I go to the spa, I'm actually still signed in as a local user or as a, a JavaScript user because that thing stores a separate uh, thing in local storage. And if I call this, even though I'm logged out, if I call it, I get a proper answer back. Even if I try to go here to user info, I'm actually not logged in. So we have two separate kinds of authentication in the same application. Don't mix and match like that. Do put your API in a separate application if you can. But it's kind of cool that you can. Uh, I am out of time. What I want to show you is one last slide, if I can get my slide deck up. There is code available. So all of this code drive demo is available uh, at that address down there. And if you want to have, if you have a Pluralsight account, um, I have a whole course on this that covers like four hours of different authentication mechanisms, um, slightly lower pace than this, like a lot of lower pace, uh, which shows all of it in more detail. Uh, if you don't have a Pluralsight account, come up and see me. Uh, I might be able to get you a 30-day trial one so you can see the course and I still get paid. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening. I hope you got something out of the session that you can bring back home and use.